Welcome back team to General Chemistry Chapter 9, Solutions. We're going to start off with 9.1 where we talk about the nature of solutions. So solutions are homogeneous mixtures composed of two or more substances that combine to form a single liquid phase. So solvent particles surround the solute particles via electrostatic interactions in a process called solvation or dissolution. Now solvent can be a water molecule, benzene or ethanol, and a solute can be NaCl, NH3, glucose, or CO2. So solvation in water, however, can also be called hydration. It breaks into molecular interactions, and most of the solutions are actually endothermic, although dissolution of gas into liquid is actually considered an exothermic reaction. So solubility is the max amount of solute that can be dissolved in a given solvent at a given temperature. It's often expressed as molar solubility, the molarity of the solute at saturation. And solubility has general solubility rules that are key points to note for the MCAT. So when we have group 1 plus ammonium, which is NH4 plus cations, we consider them water soluble. If we have acetate plus nitrate, and that's water soluble as well. So if we have Cl minus, I minus, or Br minus, with the exception of those formed with Ag plus, Pb2 plus, Hg2, 2 plus, they're also considered water soluble. So sulfate ion, which is SO4, 2 minus, with the exceptions formed with Ca2 plus. So if we have CaSO4, that would be the exception. So Ca2+, Sr2+, Ba2+, and Pb2+. Anything other than those with the sulfate ion will be water-soluble as well. All hydroxides, with the exceptions of those formed with um, any members in group 1, uh, ammonium, which is NH4+, Ca2+, Sr2+, Ba2+. So hydroxide is formed with any molecule, except with the ones that I just mentioned before, would be water insoluble. And the last key point that we need to keep in mind is carbonates, phosphates, and sulfides, sulfites um, formed will be insoluble, except if they're formed with any members from group 1 or ammonium then they will be water soluble but if that's not the case then they're most likely going to be water insoluble so complex ions or coordinate compounds are composed of metallic ions bonded to various neutral compounds and anions referred to as ligands the formation of complex ions increases solubility of otherwise insoluble ions the opposite of the common ion effect the process of forming a complex ion involves electron pair donors and electron pair acceptors, such as those seen in coordinate covalent bonding. Now we move on to 9.2, where we talk about the concentrations. So percent composition by mass is equal to mass of solute over mass of solution times 100%. And I have an example right here. So what is the percent composition? by mass of a salt water solution if 100 grams of the solution contains 20 grams of NaCl. So we write out mass of solute over mass of solution times 100. Now they've given us the 20 grams, so we're going to write that in as the mass of solute, and the mass of the solution is 100 grams, and that's also given in the equation. So this was a pretty simple example. So we've got 20 over 100, the zeros cross out, so it's 2 over 10, times 100%, that gives us 20%. Moving on to mole fraction, described with x, and that's xa is equal to moles of a over total moles of all species. And we have an example here below. So if 184 grams of glycerol, C3H8O3, is mixed with 180 grams of water, what will be the mole fractions of the two compartments? Note the molar mass of H2O is 18 grams per mole, and the molar mass of glycerol, which is C3H8O3, is 92 grams per mole. So number one, 
Find the number of moles for each compartment. So the moles for H2O, we have mass over molar mass. And the mass that they gave us was 180 grams. And the 18 grams for molar were also given. But they could easily be calculated from the periodic table. So 180 grams over 18 grams per mole, we get 10 moles of H2O. Now, we find the moles for cholesterol. Same thing, mass over molar mass, 184 over 92 grams per mole, and we get 2 moles of glycerol. So for step 2, add the moles to get the total. So total number of moles is equal to 10 plus 2, so 10 from the water molecule and 2 from the glycerol, and you get 12 moles. And for step 3, find XA. So X for water is equal to 10 moles of H2O over 12 moles total. And that gives us 0.83 for water. And for glycerol, we do the same thing, but with 2 moles, and we get 0.17. And that's the answer for this question. Now moving on to molarity, defined with a capital M, is equal to moles of solute over liters of solution. Remember that the units for molarity are moles over liters. So in this equation, we have solute over solutions. And here is another example. So if enough water is added to 11 grams of CaCl2 to make 100 milliliters of solution, what is the molarity of the solution? So our first step is to find the number of moles of CaCl2. So once again, we go moles is equal to mass over molar mass, where the mass is given, which is 11 grams, and we just find the molar mass from the periodic table, and we should get 111.1 grams per mole. When we do the calculation, we should get 0.1 moles of CaCl2. And number two, we have to find the molarity. So we go capital M is equal to moles of solute over liters of solution. The liters of solution is already given to us in milliliters, so we have to convert that to liters. So we divide the 100 in milliliter by 1,000 milliliters to get the liters, and we calculated the mole so it's 0 0.1 mole, and when we do all of that, we should get one molarity, and that's our final answer. Now moving on to molality, which is defined by a lowercase m, and it's a similar equation like molarity. However, instead of liters for molarity, for molality, we have kilograms of solvent. So it's m is equal to moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. And we have another example here. So if 10 grams of NaOH are dissolved in 500 grams of water, what is the molarity of the solution? So this first step is to find the number of moles of NaOH. So moles is equal to mass over molar mass, and we get the moles, which is 0 0.25. And for step 2, we find the molality. So that's M is equal to moles of solute over kilograms of solution. The kilograms were given in grams, so we have to convert that to kilograms. And uh, the moles for the numerator we calculated before, so we plug those in. And we get 0 0.25 moles over 0 0.5 kilograms. And our final answer is 0 0.5 molality. And that's how you solve that equation. Moving on to dilution, we have the equation M initial times V initial is equal to M final times V final. So the M is the initial molarity which is moles over liters, and volume is the initial volume, which can either be in milliliters or liters. So we have an example here. So a chemist wishes to prepare 300 milliliters of a 0 0.1 molarity NaOH solution from a 0 0.5 molarity NaOH stock solution. What volume of stock solution should be diluted with pure H2O to obtain the desired results? So 1 is recognize the equation. So we have M initial times V initial, so M final and V final. And we want to rearrange this to solve for V initial because we're talking about the stock solution. So that will create V initial is equal to M final, V final over M initial. And now we just plug in the numbers and solve for V initial. And we get 60 milliliters 
Now, on a multiple choice question, the answer could either be in milliliters or liters, so just look for that if they're asking for liters. Simply just convert the final answer to liters and you're good to go. Otherwise, you can just leave it with milliliters as well. They're both correct. It just depends on what they're asking you on the MCAT in their multiple choice answers. We're going to move on to 9.3, which is solution equilibria. So saturated solutions are in equilibrium at the particular temperature. And the saturation point is where the solute concentration is at its max value for the given temperature and pressure. The solubility product constant, also represented as K a subscript of S and P, is the equilibrium constant for a dissociation reaction. So we have AgCl with the products of Ag plus plus Cl minus. So the Ksp would be Ag plus and Cl minus. So in this, we only have the product concentrations. Comparison of ion product, so IP, to Ksp determines the level of saturation and behavior of the solution. So if IP is less than Ksp, we know that the solution is unsaturated. And if more solute is added, it will dissolve. However, if IP is equal to Ksp, the solution is saturated at equilibrium and there will be no change in concentrations. However, if we have IP that is greater than Ksp, the solution is super saturated and will most likely see a precipitate form. So the formation or stability constant, and that's the equilibrium constant for complex formation, and its value is usually much greater than Ksp. The formation of a complex increases the solubility of other salt containing the same ions because it uses up the products of those dissolution reactions, shifting the equilibrium to the right. That's the opposite of the common ion effect. So the, the common ion effect actually decreases the solubility of a compound in a solution that already contains one of the ions in the compound. So the presence of that ion in solution shifts the dissolution reaction to the left, decreasing its dissociation. Next, we move on to 9.4, which is colligative properties. So these are physical properties of solution that depend on the concentration of dissolved particles, but not on their chemical identity. And there are four colligative properties that we need to be aware of. One of them is vapor pressure depression. So that's Rolf's law. So the presence of other solutes is equal to the decrease in evaporation rate and has no effect on the condensation rate. And that decreases the vapor pressure and increases the boiling point. So as vapor pressure decreases, th there is an increase in temperature or energy required to boil. And this is the equation that we use here. So Pa is equal to Xa times Pa in its pure state. So Pa is the vapor pressure of solvent A when in solute. Xa is the mole fraction of solvent A when in solute. And Pa is the vapor pressure of solvent A in its pure state. Next, we move on to the boiling point elevation. The shifts in the phase equilibria are dependent on the molality of the solution. And this is the equation that we have here. So delta Tb, which is an increase in boiling point in Kelvin, is equal to I which is the Van Hoff factor, which is the number of particles into which a compound dissociates, times Kb, which is a proportionality constant, and that's usually provided, times molality, which is moles over kilogram. So Van Hoff example, where I is equal to 2 for NaCl because it dissociates into two particles, Na plus and Cl minus. Next, we have the freezing point depression that shifts in the phase equilibria are dependent in the molality of the solution. So it's delta Tf is equal to I times Kf times M. And the delta Tf is the freezing point depression in Kelvin. The I is the Van Hoff factor. The Kf is the constant that's provided. And M is a molality again in moles over kilogram. Next we have is osmotic pressure. It refers to a sucking pressure generated by solutions in which water is drawn into a solution. 
is the amount of pressure that must be applied to counteract this attraction of H2O molecules of the solution. And this is the equation that we have here. So we have osmotic pressure, and that's the symbol for that, is equal to I, which is the Van Hoff factor, times M, which is the molality, times R, the ideal gas constant, and times T in Kelvin. And that brings us to the end of chapter 9. I'll see you guys in chapter 10. Take care.